It is far too easy to get caught up in the technical details of attacks like solar winds. It is important to look deeper into the ramifications of such nation state attacks because it can give important insights to the potential long term directions. Now, there are many different types of threat agents that do hacking. Uh, the most familiar are cyber criminals. We all know that. We've all felt that. But other archetypes exist as well. Data harvesters, disgruntled employees, uh, anarchists, radical activists, vandals, and many, many others. And each of them have their own distinct goals, objectives, resources, limitations, and preferred attack methods. Take a look at threat agent archetypes if you're interested on the internet, or uh, let me know and I can also create another video about them. It's kind of one of my passions. But l let's get back to nation states. Now, nation states, out of all those threat agents, they're really the pinnacle of hackers because of their significant investment. Sometimes governments will invest billions of dollars into these programs and the skills and the talent that they can then attract and apply is mind boggling. Uh, in fact, it can uh, far outscale what any single company or organization can put on the defense side. And in many cases, they can uh, be far greater than even some of the top cybersecurity firms. And the other thing is they're not really bounded by laws. They operate at the discretion and under the protection of governments. So, it is an entirely different class of threat agent that we have to deal with when we're talking about nation states. And many governments outsource such activities. Um, they will basically hire crews to go out and do what they need to do, hacking crews, and pay them well. And sometimes those hacking crews have side jobs or off-season jobs, if you will, uh, being cyber criminals. So you get a lot of bleed over sometimes with some of these groups. Now, the most sophisticated groups, the, the governments that are really into this, so think of the big countries out there uh, with their cyber cap capabilities, uh, they basically, they dedicate teams. They build them up um, and become part of their intelligence or military or political apparatus. They want a sustainable capability that grows better and better every year. Now, one thing to note is just like any other uh, of the intelligence agencies or military or, or whatnot, cyber is just another domain. It's just another tool for leaderships of nations to push their political agenda, either domestically uh, or definitely internationally. So cyber is just another tool in that toolbox and it can be used in many ways to support those kinds of directions. Um, and, you know, we kind of look at the different reasons nation states actually invest so much money and, you know, try and achieve certain objectives. And it really kind of comes down to four areas of, you know, why nation states hack. So let's take a look at really those four different areas. The first one is, well, it's kind of everyday espionage, right? Espionage has been around for, well, centuries. And, you know, we see the heyday of it uh, post-World War II during the Cold War. And you've got organizations like within the United States, um, you've got the Defense Intelligence Agency for the military, you've got the Central Intelligence Agency and, you know, the NSA. Uh, and other countries have similar counterparts. And each one does something a little different. You know, one may be looking at open source intelligence and manage actual physical assets people in the field, uh, like the CIA does. Uh, other organizations may do uh, intercepts of electronic information and deciphering those. NSA specializes in that. And you've got people that look at reconnaissance satellite pictures and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is normal. Uh, one country spying on another and sometimes even spying on allies, uh, which seems kind of weird, but yes, that happens as well. 
And, um, you know, they look at the inner workings of a country, a government, their military infrastructure, things of that sort. So cyber is absolutely used for that purpose as an extension of those legacy spy agencies coming out of the Cold War. This is a, a great new capability and power. So, yes, they're going to use it. The second reason is around financial gain. Now, this may be a little hard to grab, but uh, you know, think about it, uh, especially for embargoed or sanctioned nations that really need hard currency. Um, they are using cyber attacks to go out and fleece the world and get that money back into their country so that they can get around sanctions. Um, and the embargo then won't be as painful. Uh, and in some cases, for some countries, they use it to conduct economic espionage. Now, economic espionage, think of it as industrial espionage, but being conducted by a government to benefit government-run um, industries, companies, uh, to make sure that the, the country itself is maybe coming up in certain technology areas. And we see that a lot. There are some very large countries that have for decades used this uh, to their advantage. Now, the third area is really around critical infrastructure, uh, which would include government and defense. And these are staging attacks. These are cyber attacks that get in and they want to create a capability and become very stealthy and just quiet. And what it enables them to do is during times of stress or when their government needs options to do things, the cyber teams can go, hey, we've already infiltrated all these different things. We can do X, Y, and Z for you. We're already ready at a moment's notice to activate those capabilities and we're already there. So we see a lot of staging. It's, it's been going on, especially in critical infrastructure. So, um, you know, power and water and, and very much so in uh, defense and in government, things of that sort. Cyber attacks, governments stage, right? They go in and this is a strategic advantage for them. So we see governments going down that road as well. Now, the fourth option, and this is a little disturbing, I don't want to scare anybody, but it's a reality. Because modern nations are so entrenched, tied and dependent on digital technology now, especially with our critical infrastructure, right? Um, the, the food that, that shows up on the shelves in the grocery store, the fuel that you can pump out of the gas station, all of that is dependent on digital technology. So is the power, the electricity, the water, um, you know, natural gas, things of that sort. Uh, shipping, logistics, communications, transport, all of those are deeply reliant upon the digital infrastructure of the country of the world. So if you can go in and disrupt that, that's basically an attack, right? And you have options of a small attack or a big attack, and we've seen those actually in the real world. We've seen in Eastern Europe where the banking um, uh, infrastructure was taking down and people couldn't get money out of their ATMs or, or, or use the banks. We've seen several times, uh, specifically in Ukraine, where the electrical grid was taken down by hacks. You know, we're seeing things like this, it's normal. But when we talk about a digital nuclear option, it's really about preparing a highly coordinated set of attacks that create a cascading set of failures to destroy the infrastructure of a nation. And that would include the financial systems, the government, the social stability of the people, the health care, the food dis distribution, electricity, communications, and even military effectiveness. Now, permanent damage to these systems in a cascading and sweeping way can actually result in massive casualties, long-term outages of basic services, severe economic crisis um, that dwarfs anything that we've ever seen, and social chaos. It can turn brother against brother in some cases. It could turn a world leader like the United States into a third world nation in a matter of weeks. Now, think about that for a moment. 
right? No power, no communications, no internet, no phones. Um, people can't run their businesses. They can't get food or fuel or anything like that. And they're in darkness in regards to what's going on and what's being done. Um, depending on the type of permanent attacks to actually destroy equipment capabilities and so on and so forth, um, it could weaken a nation to fracture and even fuel internal revolution. So that's that nuclear option. And basically it's considered an act of war, right? But that may be down in the future of mankind somewhere. That may be how wars are kicked off. Now, when we look at something like solar winds that has compromised a wide swath of US government agencies, national critical infrastructures and their suppliers, major wealthy corporation, a vast majority of the Fortune 500, we can see several of these motivations might be in play. So it's good to do an analysis, just a quick one, to see really what we're facing so far. And so far, it does appear to be related to um, it does not appear to be related to financial gain, right? No major financial uh, assets or thefts have been reported, um, but there could be an element of ec uh, economic espionage that we haven't yet discovered. So that is a possibility. We'll have to kind of be on the lookout for that. We are seeing indications that espionage activities are occurring. And there's really no surprise there, right? Intelligence branches are always tasked with understanding the plans, weaknesses, key players, and priorities of other nations. This is usually passive in, and comes in the form of data gathering, right? That's everyday kind of stuff that we totally expect. We are seeing that, that's for sure. We also expect critical infrastructure staging attacks and solar winds may have some aspects here um, to increase what the attacking nation already has access to. And I know that's a little disturbing to say, but that's the reality. Um, it is a continual cat and mouse game to try and locate these attacks and evict them. Uh, it's something that's played out every single day across critical infrastructure. Um, so we have to kind of accept that. And solar winds might be aiding greatly to that. We'll find out in the next few weeks uh, as the critical infrastructure people start to report and, and if, if they choose to make it public. Now, we have the fourth option as well. And we hope that all nation state attacks, in, in, including the solar winds attack, is not a step down this path to destruction, right? And so far, the attackers have not intentionally caused system damage and have not applied a scorched earth policy, right, as they're being detected and evicted. And that's something we would expect, right? If they really wanted to cause harm, if they wanted to enact this, as soon as they're being detected, you would start seeing systems self-destruct and not the malware per se, the malware would be destroying the systems and capabilities that it's infected. It would go nuclear, right? And try and destroy as much as possible, as fast as possible and in the most permanent way. So right now, it still looks like an intelligence gathering and critical infrastructure staging exercise. That's the good news. So <laughs> there is bad news, however, right? And the bad news is right now, we don't really know the full picture. Over the past week, the companies, agencies, and cybersecurity organizations have been working around the clock to better understand the mechanics of the attack. A few of us are also looking at this bigger picture to see if we can discern how this might play in a strategic narrative. In the coming weeks, the cybersecurity community will have a much better understanding on not only the how, but also the why when it comes to this hack of the decade. So stay tuned.